not came forward. Scott, you can go ahead and, and make your way up here. Um, Scott is a pastor, and he would never tell you this, at Maryland Community Church of a pretty large church. And I know in my mind, it's probably bigger now than what it was when I, but you were around 3,000. Where are you now? About that? Okay, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So COVID hit them a little, so they're down a little bit. But they were, at the time when I first met, uh, they were pushing that 3,000 mark. And my sister goes there, my brother-in-law goes there, and they went through a major uh, life crisis. And uh, I was staying up, my brothers worked thirds, talking to my brother-in-law and uh, trying to help him out to make some decisions. But he had a huge amount of respect for his pastor. And so I thought, well, can't hurt. And so I threw out a message to Scott. And uh, that same day, uh, he stopped what he was doing. And he went over and he spent time with my sister and with my brother-in-law and has walked with them. Uh, they both are in the church. They are raising all four of their kids in the church. Uh, Scott has picked up my brother-in-law to bring him to men's meetings with him. Uh, so this is a, a pastor with a huge flock, but a huge pastor's heart. And, uh, and I couldn't be more thankful uh, for him being their pastor. Uh, I'm, the last thing I'm going to say is this. He's, he has some books. that He is an author of those books. They're outside, and he probably wouldn't want to say that, uh, but they're there and available, and I guarantee that they can help you in some parts of your life uh, where you need to step up and, and grow for the Lord. And so consider that as you leave today. They're only in this lobby, so you'll have to go that way. Uh, but if you would, put your hands together for my friend Scott Long here. Thank you. It's, uh, it's, been, it's really interesting watching, uh, watching what the Lord's been doing. Uh, just the spirit, I know you probably heard the term revival around, like, right? And you're like, is this a revival? Is it not a revival? You watch things that have been spinning up at Asbury and different college campuses. I think that it's, this is one of the greatest times to be alive because we're watching the Lord do things that a lot of us have been praying for for years. Um, and it's pretty incredible. And I will tell you, uh, if a church um, would say, we're going to have a week-long revival or call it something different, um, the chances of it being successful or people coming would be pretty low. Like, this is not normal, is what I'm trying to say. Like, and, you're, and you all aren't normal. Like, can, and you're like, all right, I, I get that, I get that. I'm not normal. You got a guy who's, who's not normal, right? And then you, uh, it was interesting because Paul called, he's like, we're doing a uh, you know, best sermon ever conference, and I'm like, what? I do the, like the worst sermon ever. Like, I'll come for that. But here's how we play it back at my ha at my house, um, the, the Lord's house, really. But back back where where the people that I run with is that we kind of preach together. And so uh, I will preach sometimes, and people will talk back to me. Now the rule is you have to talk back nice to me, okay? <laughs> so if you agree with something, don't be afraid to go like, oh, that's right, amen. If you see me struggling, just pray, Jesus, help him. I feel like this isn't the best sermon ever. Please dig, dig him out of the ditch, right? Right, we'll go. But I'm confident that the Lord's going to continue to do just a good, good work. And what I think is beautiful about uh, times like these is it just gives us a little bit of time just to exhale, right? You remember the, uh, uh, back in the day, my grandma would have like a snow globe. Remember those? You may probably have some of those. Like you'd shake those things up and they'd just be going, going around. And sometimes I feel like that's our life every day. And we just have a, a chance tonight to just kind of be still, let that kind of settle down, and just ask the Holy Spirit, like, what do you have to speak to us today? What do you have to speak to me today? Can I encourage you that, like, what you're experiencing it, it, this week and beyond, like, I walked in and started talking to some people, and, like, I felt like this was home. Like, if I was here, I would be here. Like, if I lived here, I would be in a place like this, and I would be part of your family whether you like me or not, right? The Lord's doing some special, special stuff here. So uh, we're going we're gonna to dig in today. Here's what I want you to, to, to think about. I want you to think about, don't say, don't, talk, to, don't back, talk, talk back to me on this, but I want you just to think in your mind, think about the most negative, harshest one word that you know. And you're like, whoa, 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 wait a minute, what you, the preacher asking me to think about some bad, simple words. Think about the one word that if you said it, don't say it, but if you said it, would cause the most damage. Like the word, if you stood up at your job or at your school and you said it, people would be like, oh, that's damaging. Think about that word. Okay, on the count of three, we're all going to say it really loud, okay? One, I'm just kidding. Don't do it. Don't do it. But I'm going to say the word. The most damaging word today is this word. He's going to say it. I can't believe. Is he going to say my word? I hope he doesn't say my word. I know what you're thinking, right? 
It's the word no. It's the word no. I was surprised to learn that that professor, a professor of neurology did a study where they did an MRI scan and they flashed the word no in front of someone for a millisecond. They just flashed the word no and in less than one second, it released dozens of stress-producing hormones. Just seeing the word no. They would, it would interrupt normal functions of the brain, just seeing or hearing the word no. The word no would impair logic and reason and language and processing and communication. If they continue to flash the word no in front of people, it started to increase their levels of anxiety and depression. The more we hear the word no, the more it damages key structures they found, the way it regulates memories and feelings. It affects sleep and appetite and long-term happiness. It is the most damaging word in our vocabulary. And can we just say we've got some pretty damaging words in our vocabulary, don't we? Think about the frequency by which we hear the most damaging word in the world. COVID was one big, giant no wasn't it? Can you go out? No. Can I go out with it without a mask? No. Can I meet for church? No. Can I gather with people at my house? Probably not. Can friends come over? No, 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 no. That's on top of, of, can my kids go to school? No. It was just no after no after no. And what we're finding now is that there's just erosion that has happened that some, some uh, people who study Behavioral sciences would say we're not even beginning to learn the damage that that has caused. Now that's on top of the world that we live in, which is a world of no's, right? When you're a kid, you ask your parent for stuff. What do you tell your kid more than anything else in the world? No. Can I have this? No. Can I have a pony? No. Can I have a truck? No. Can I have a cookie? No. No, no, no. What's the, a kid's first word? No. We come out saying no all the time, right? Your spouse will tell you no. You ask a person out, they tell you no. You ask mom, no, dad, no. College, sorry, you get a rejection there. Maybe I can get a, get a little bit more money at work. That's a no. It's no, no, no. And it begins to just continue to erode our soul. And then on top of that, unfortunately, the church oftentimes has a language of no, don't we? No, you can't do that. No, we never did that. If you're in church leadership, what you hear from people a lot of times is no, 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 no. Can't try that. Can't do this. Can't do that. It's just it's continual. No, what happens is it, we continue to be eroded. I was um, uh, just last week, I was checking into a hotel, a couple weeks ago, checking into a hotel. And the guy that was there, I don't even know how this came up, but I'm checking in and he's, and he's like, I'm a retired professor of worship at this small college over here, uh, but I'm working uh, at the hotel now. And I'm like, oh, great. I'm like, I'm, like, I'm a pastor. And just like that, he started talking bad about the church. He's like, well, I never knew, but I got into the church, and then I, I realized that if you have the money, you can do what you want to do. And people tell you no all the time. And he just started digging on the church. And I'm telling you, that is 98% of the conversations that I have with church leaders, whether they're staff or they're leaders. It's about the negativity that's inside of the church. And I just looked at him, and I said, I'll tell you something, bro. She may be harsh. But there's nothing that works like the local church when the local church is working right. Nothing like it. But the problem is, is that we continue to have these notes. And so we jump into Psalm chapter 16 in verse 9. And I'm going to bounce around a bunch of different scriptures tonight. But Psalm 16, 9 says this. And think about this. In a world full of no's, where are we supposed to find some joy? Psalm 16, 9 says this. Therefore, my heart is glad, my tongue rejoices, and my body will also rest secure. My heart is glad. Does that describe me? Like, am I a glad person or am I a bitter person? Am I a person that's heard no so many times and I'm saying no so many times? Does my tongue really rejoice or does my tongue complain? The Holy Spirit's been convincing, convicting me on a lot of that lately. Am I a yeah, but kind of guy? Am I a no guy? And my body will also rest secure. Anybody else wrestle around with anxiety, depression? Like, that's me, man. Like, my, for my body to rest secure is like, is like maybe once every full moon, maybe, right? So, so I'm like, okay, um, we're living in a no world. It's eroding us. But then I read this, and I think the Lord would say, I want your heart to be glad. I want your tongue to rejoice. I want your body to rest secure. That sounds like joy, but does that describe us? And how in a no, in a no world, in a world littered with no's, 
How are we supposed to, how are we supposed to live with joy? And here's what I want to tell you today. So you're going, to, you're going to dinner, you're like, what did that guy talk about? Here's what I want to tell you today. There's joy at the gate. There's joy at the gate. That makes sense, doesn't it? That makes sense. There's joy at the gate. That doesn't make it. You're like, what? Okay, what are you talking about? I want to, I want to dig into that because I've just been fascinated by what I, what I found in that. So let's jump in. We're going to be in John chapter 10 for, uh, for most of this. John chapter 10, and we will start at verse 1. Jesus describes himself with several, several different descriptives, right? He calls himself by different names, but he calls himself by a very unique name in John and chapter 10. Here we go, John 10.1. These are the words of Jesus. He says this, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate. So now he's going to go sheep and shepherds, and he's going to use that, that kind of metaphor for us. Anybody who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is a shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listens to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. And when he has brought them out all on his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. Ah, oh, that's so good. But they'll never follow a stranger. In fact, they'll run away from a stranger because they don't recognize the stranger's voice. Verse 6. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. So, J- so Jesus is like, all right, all right, let me drop it down for you so you can understand, right? Verse 7, so he said to them again, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. You ever walked up to somebody and they're like, they're like I don't know if you've met me before, I'm the gate. What? That had to be so strange, right? All who have come, verse 8, before me are thieves and robbers. The sheep have not listened to them. And then he says it again, I'm the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They'll come in, they'll go out, they'll find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that they would have a life and have it to the full. What in the world is Jesus talking about when he says he's the gate? Well, to understand what he's saying, we kind of need to understand a little bit of, of culture and history at the time. And so if you were a shepherd back in these days, there'd be two different kinds of gates. Like you would have sheep. And so you would be out uh, and, and you would have your, your sheep all day long. Then at night, you would need to put your sheep into a pen. Now, the, sheep, the, the, the pen on the left, you can see there's a wooden gate that's right there. If you were near a city, you would likely go to a sheep pen that would be like this. So you would take your sheep and you would say, hey, I will put my sheep in here for the night, right? And then somebody else, Paul, would come along with his sheep, and they would put his sheep in there. Then there would be a gatekeeper that would stand watch all night over the sheep while you went and got some rest, and then you would come back. Side note, when the shepherd would stand there, he would call his sheep. Those sheep would come out because the sheep know the shepherd's voice. So Paul would come up and say, where's my sheep? And all the sheep would go with him because they know his master's voice. I don't have time to preach on that, but that'll preach. Okay, so if you're around the city, you have, you have a gate. If you're a shepherd and you're out on the countryside, which many shepherds were, and night falls, you don't have time to get all your flock back to the city. You have to find a makeshift or, or a, a pen that somebody else has made along the way. So out in the country, it would look similar to what we see on the right. The difference is, there is no gate. So what a shepherd would do, if he has his sheep out in the country, away from everybody else for the night, he would put his sheep inside the pen, and then the shepherd would literally lay or sleep in that, in that opening, and he became the gate. So Jesus, we know, is saying, I'm the gate. I'm the shepherd who becomes the gate. That's what he's, that's, that's what he's saying here. He's not saying, I am the gatekeeper. He's saying, I am the gate. By the way, when he says, I am, he's saying, I will be what I will be. I'm the all-sustaining gate. So you're like, okay, still, what, is, what does all of that mean? Well, let's drop down in that a little bit. And let me tell you why I believe there's joy at the gate. Now, you have to think just in this metaphor term that we're the sheep and Christ is the shepherd. One reason that Jesus calls us sheep is because sheep are what? Any ideas? Stupid, dumb, basic, dumb animals, right? You're like, I'm smarter than that. Like, no, you're not. I've seen the things you've done. I've I've, I've watched the way you behave. No, you're not. We're all dumb, right? So we're the sheep and he's the shepherd. So get that metaphor in, in, in your head and imagine that the Lord is leading us out during the day and then leading us in there at night. And here I would tell you this, just a few reasons that there's joy at the gate. And one is this, because there's joy at the gate because we're safe at the gate because we're safe at the gate. Now let's dig on this a little bit. Verse nine, Jesus says this, I'm the gate. 
whoever enters through me will be saved. Now, if you're around church any time, like we talk about being saved a lot in the church. Being saved, 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 saved. And if you're outside of the church or you're kind of new to faith, you're like, that's weird. That's weird talk. Like I never thought about being saved. Okay, but, but being saved literally means this. Here's the definition of saved. To deliver out of danger and into safety. And it's used principally of God's rescuing believers from the penalty and power of sin. And so when we talk about like being saved, what we're talking about, it's the gospel story. That you and I have sin in our life. We have done wrong. We have done things against God. We have, we have done things that have disappointed him, and we have sin. And in God's economy, somebody has to pay for that sin. And so if I stand before God, and, and, and he's like, Scott, you've done all this wrong. And I'm like, yeah, I've done it all. And then the penalty for that has to come on me. Except God made a, for a way out. This is the story of the gospel, friends, right? And this, the way out is that Christ took the punishment for my sin. So I can stand before God and say, yeah, I have done terrible things in my life. I have sinned against you in small ways and in big ways. And I know that I deserve punished. And God punishes in his economy. I know that I deserve to be punished. But I, because I've asked Christ to be the forgiver and leader of my life, I've accepted him, I've chased after him, been baptized into him. I'm asking that all of my punishment be transferred to Christ. So I am saved from the punishment of sin that should come to me and then it's transferred to Christ. So look, there's joy at the gate because I'm saved at the gate. That means, that means I, I, I lock eyes with Jesus and he's like, what sin do you have in your life? And I'm like, well, none that I can be punished for because Christ has taken all of it. Like I've saved at the gate. And some of you, here's what I think. I think some of you have probably been forgiven of some things in your life and the Lord has forgiven you, but you haven't forgiven yourself. And you're hanging on to something. Here I'm just telling you, like, you're saved at the gate. Like Christ has saved you. That's like looking at Jesus and saying, I know that the cross was a big deal, but it just doesn't cover my sins. It covers all of that. You're saved at the gate. But here's something else that, that I think we overlook. Not only are we saved at the gate, we're safe at the gate. We're safe at the gate. You know what I find? I find a lot of people who are followers of Jesus are running around scared a lot of the times. I know I am. What happens if this, and what happens if this, and what happens if this? And I have to remind myself, wait, I'm at the gate. I'm near Jesus. If I'm near Jesus, I'm safe, and I'm safe at the gate. And I don't know about you, but I can get in this mental spin that can throw me in a bad place emotionally and mentally. Be like, oh, what if this happens? Then this is going to happen, and that's going to happen, and that's going to happen. And I was talking to a, a counselor, uh, one of my, my counselor, and, and uh, she asked once, like, what's the worst that could happen? I'm like, well, that sounds like a terrible counseling technique. What's the worst that could happen? But as you start playing that out, you're like, that's not, that's really not bad. You run that out. Like I, I had a friend of mine who's like, he's like, Scott, I'm like in, like I'm, my boss and I have been like this and it's not going good. And, and it's just, it's just not good. It's just not good. And I'm like, I'm like, thinking, I'm like, I'm like well, I heard a technique. I'm, I'm like, what's the worst that could happen? He's like, well, man, the worst that could happen is that, that I'm fired. That would be the worst that I could happen. I'm like, that's not the worst that could happen. He's like, no, man, the worst that could happen is I could get fired, and then I could not be able to pay my bills. I'm like, well, that's not the worst that could happen. He's like, well, no, man, if I get fired and I can't pay my bills, the worst that could happen is like I would get evicted from my house. I'm like, bro, that's not the worst thing that could happen. He's like, man, if I get evicted from my house because I can't pay my bills, I can maybe have to move in with my in-laws. And I'm like, that probably is the worst that could happen. <laughs> that might be kind of bad. But I'm like, that's not really the worst that could happen. Like, what's the worst that could happen? And like, we went through the whole thing, and like, if you, if you trace that on down, you'd be like, I guess the worst that could happen is that, is that I would die. Put that on any situation that you have. What's the worst that could happen to me in this situation? That end always comes to the same conclusion. I could die. Except if you're a Christian. That's not the worst that could happen. Listen, here's what Paul says, Philippians chapter 1. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's like he's wrestling around now like, I don't know whether I should live or if I should die. Because they're both awesome. And you're like, what, Paul? If I go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful label. labor. What, what do I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. The two what? To live or die, he says. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it's more necessary for you that I remain here. Here's what Paul's saying. Either way, I'm safe. I'm safe at the gate. That's the thing. As a follower of Jesus, if you said yes to him, your eternity is locked in, man. That means if you die, you get an upgrade. And I'm not trying to be trite about it, like in the past, 
the end of last year, I lost, lost five very, very close friends. And it gutted me, and I missed them. And I think their time on earth was cut way too short. But every one of them said the same thing, not in the exact words, but they said the same thing. They said, I'm not afraid to die. A little concerned about how, I'm not afraid to die because I know where I'm going to be. And death for us, friends, is an upgrade. So maybe we just need to stop running around scared. I don't know. Because here's what I find is that we know we're saved, but we don't live like we're safe. We know we're saved, but we often don't live like we're safe. Listen, he's with us, and that should change how we live. Here, Romans, Paul says this. It says, if God's for us, then who can be against us? Like, if he's for us, then who can be against us? Listen, he is for you. And I know you're like, oh, I don't know, man. I got this stuff in my life, and I got this. Yes, and Christ has eradicated that. If you've become his follower, if you become his, he is for you. Think about it like this. If he's for you, man, it changes things. Like, if you know that you're safe with him, like, it changes things. Years ago, we were on a, a, a mission trip to South Africa. And as part of the mission trip, uh, trips, the leaders were like, we're going to go on a safari. And I'm like, that's amazing. So this was like a safari in Africa, folks. Like, this wasn't like the zoo. This was Africa. I'm like, this is great. So we went out one day, and we got in the safari trucks, and we're driving out, seeing all these animals. And then we come in for dinner, and there's this kind of chatter going on. Somebody walks up to me, and they're like, Scott, tomorrow they said they would take like a half a dozen of us on a walking safari. I'm like, what's a walking safari? And they're like, you're an idiot. It's a safari where we walk. What do you think it is? And I'm like, you mean that we're going to walk like where the animals are? They're like, yes. I'm like, <laughs> I'm in. Let's go. <laughs> so the next morning, we get up. We jump in this, in this truck. This is our, our group here. Like, there's a couple guides that are right here. Friends, like, we're out, we're out in it. It's not like we're behind barbed wire fences. Like, we're out in it. Notice my boy to the left with the elephant gun. Like, so he's with us. And I'm like, all right, this guy's with us. So we're walking out. True story. We're walking out through the bush, and as we're walking, I'm walking by this guy, and, and the, the dude with the gun, and he's going, and all of a sudden, he just stops and goes, like this. And I'm like, that, that looks serious. That looks serious. So I snapped this picture behind him, and if you look over his shoulder, can you see that in the bush? She's like 30 feet away. So I'm over here, he stops, and he's looking right there, and there's the lion. Like, this is a legit lion. So you know what I did? I'm behind the guy with a gun, man. I'm behind the guy with a gun. And you know what? I was safe. You know I was safe? Why I was safe? I didn't have anything on it. I didn't have a gun on me. I couldn't have wrestled this beast down. I wasn't like, let's go. I was safe because of who was with me. And he's just a guide in South Africa. You are with the creator of the universe. You think he's not going to protect you? He's leading you to risk some things. He's asking you to give financially. You're like, I don't know. He is with you, and he is for you. You are safe at the gate. It's the safest place to be in the world. I'm not saying that we'd be re we're reckless, but the Lord's going to call us to do things that we're like, I don't know about that. You just have to know that he's for us, and he's with us, and you're safe at the gate. Here's the second thing I want to tell you, that there's joy at the gate because we're known at the gate. Because we're known. Man, here's what I, the older I get, I, here's what, I know that everybody just wants to be known. We want to be known. Like, we don't want to be famous, but we want to be known. Now, let's dive in. Verse 9. I'm the gate. Whoever enters through me, Jesus says, will be saved. That's safe, right? They will come in and go out and find pasture. You're like, well, okay, well, I thought you said we were known at the gate. Now you're talking about they're come in and go out. But we got to dig in a little bit contextually. So, so if you will, let's just dive, dive deep a little bit with me for, for a minute. In Old Testament language, in common conversation, they would talk about the going out and the coming in, the going out and the coming in, the going out and the coming in. And so when Jesus would say, he, they will come out and go in, he would be using a common language that they would go like, I know what you mean. The coming in represented an intimacy with God the Father. The going out meant that you would go out and you would do work. There's a coming in and there's a going out. And so Jesus was saying this, my sheep, here's what my sheep do. They go out. They go out in the pasture. They go out to their jobs. They go out to the places where they serve. But they also come into the gate with me in the secret place. They're with me in the intimate place. Here's what I find we do. 
We're like, man, I know this Jesus, and, he's, and, I, and I said yes to him, and I was intimate uh, with him. We had this great relationship, but now I'm just out, and I'm doing the work, and I'm doing the stuff, and I'm doing, 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 doing. And all of a sudden, I'm like, why am I not so close to Jesus anymore? Because you're going out, but you're not coming in. Notice the order that Jesus gives. They will come in before they go out. They'll come in before they go out. You know what happens when sheep come into a pen? I mean, some suggested this, that the sheep would come into the pen one at a time, and as the shepherd would lay across the gate, or maybe I get the picture of the shepherd kneeling at the gate. I think all the, she- all the sheep have been out for the day, right? They've been out to Starbucks, they've been out to their job, they've been out working on the, the trucks and cars, and they've been delivering mail, and they've been doing all this stuff. And here the sheep come in, and the sheep come in one at a time, and the shepherd, a good shepherd, and Jesus is a good shepherd, right? A good shepherd checks every one of his sheep as he's coming in. And I think he assesses how they were during the day. Now, can you imagine your shepherd? I, I, picture, I picture Jesus just kneeling as, as the gate, right, and coming in, and he's looking at one of the sheep, and he's like, he's like what are you doing? And he's like, hey, 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 you have had way too much caffeine today, haven't you? All right, it's been a hyper day for you. Get in here. We're going to talk a little bit. You come on in. You've been out. Now you come on in. Another sheep, sheep comes in just kind of dragging. Now you're tired today, aren't you? You've been kind of had a hard day, haven't you? Yeah, you come on in. Another sheep comes in. Why are you limping? You got in another scuffle, didn't you? Somebody came and attacked you again, didn't they? You come on in. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come. We're going to spend a little bit of time together. I think another sheep would come in, and I think Jesus would reach down and say, why are you not looking at me? And raise up and see shame in the eyes of some sheep. Oh, you made a mistake again, didn't you? You're feeling shame and remorse again, aren't you? Come in. We're going to spend some time together. That's what the Father does. And so listen, I think most of the mistakes that we make is we're like, I'm going to do stuff for Jesus. I'm going to do stuff for Jesus. I want to do stuff for I'm tired of doing things for Jesus. I want to do things with Jesus. And if your life is only determined, like, I'm going to do, 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 it is, there's, there is a going out. But what makes it all work is the coming in. Think about the people that you want to hang around the most. If it's like, if, if I ask you, if there's one person that you would want to be around that, that would have a spiritual influence on you, think about that person. I guarantee you that that person spends time at the gate with the shepherd. That's the magic sauce, friends. That's what it is. Jesus is our great gate. He is our great shepherd. So could I just ask you, like, does that sound like joy? Man, that's, that's joy, isn't it? And to hear, it says that the, the shepherd knows the name of his sheep. So he'll call you by name, and then he knows what's happened to you on the outside as he brings you in. I don't know what that does to you, but to me, I'm like, that. Lord, thanks for that. Thanks that I'm not alone. Thank you that you see my scars. Thank you that you see my failures. Here's the thing. The Lord doesn't turn you away. He's like, come on in. And now I'm going to protect you while we're together and while we're here. And so where is your pen with the Lord? Where's your time with the Lord? Like, Do you have a place or do you have a time? What would that look like if, if you did? You have some time carved out every day where it's like just, and we pray all the time. Like, I get that. We pray all the time. We're supposed to do that. But a time where it's like, okay, it's just me and the Lord now. Just, you have to protect that time. So, so you may want to wrestle around with that a little bit. Let me give you this third one as, as we kind of land here. The, a third reason there's joy at the gate, and this is, I love this, because we hear yes at the gate. Think about this. We're in a no world. We're, no, 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 no. I'm telling you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have a language of yes. Can I have a brand new car? Yes. Can I have a vacation home? Yes. I'm not saying that. But they are, they are yes, Right? Imagine the shepherd with every sheep. There's a no on the outside, but there's a, there's a yes on the inside. The, your father is a father of yes. From the very beginning of time, think about this. God creates the heavens and the earth, Genesis. And then he says to, to Adam and Eve, all of this, all of this is yours, just not the tree, just not the tree. Can you imagine the conversation? It's not recorded, but I imagine in my mind the conversation with, with Adam. Adam. Adam's like, all of it? Yep, all of it. Like that tree? Yep, that tree? Yep, that tree? Yep, that tree? Yep. Do we have to keep going? Yes, 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 yes. It's, imagine everything that God created. It was yes to everything except one tree. That's like a billion, gazillion to one because he's a God of yes, isn't he? 
And we've grown up with so many no's that we think God is a God of no. Become a follower of Jesus. Like, can you sleep in on Sunday? No. Can you smoke? No. Can you drink? No. Can you chew? No. Can you go with girls that do? No, 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 no. And that's what we've reduced it to. And the Lord's like, there may be some small no's, but I got a million yeses. And a million yeses that brings life. Listen, listen to Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I love this. He says, for the Son of God, he's going to describe Jesus now. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it has always been what? Yes. It has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they're yes in Christ. And then I love what he says. And so through him, the amen is spoken to us to the glory of God. You know what amen means? Amen means so be it. Amen, amen means like, yes, yes. That's what it means. So Paul's saying there are yes in Christ and there are amen. It's like, amen's like a period at the end of the sentence. Amen's like, yes, and that's how it is. That's what Paul's saying. All the promises in Christ are yes, and that's how it is. He's not saying that it's yes, if, or yes, however, or yes, only, or yes, but it's yes, period. Think about that. Can you forgive me, God? You know what the enemy wants us to hear? No. Jesus says, yes. Can you forgive me? Yes, period. Can you give me wisdom? Yes, period. Can you meet me in my depression? Yes, period. Can you actually forgive the abuse that I have dished out? Yes, period. Can you actually heal the abuse that I've taken? Yes, period. Can you curb my anxiety? Yes, period. Can you walk with me in the loneliness? Yes, period. Can you heal my cancer? Yes, period. Can you heal this church? Yes, period. Can you guide me? Yes, period. And I think maybe we're just so depleted because we've not spent time in the pen hearing the voice of the Father say yes. Friends, there's joy at the gate, right? I mean, we're safe at the gate. Let me review real quick. There's joy at the gate because we're safe at the gate. There's joy at the gate because we're known at the gate. And there's joy at the gate because we hear yes at the gate. That turns us, us dumb sheep, like us shy sheep, I think, into sheep with a little bit of attitude. I try to look for a picture of sheep with attitude. This is the best I could get right here. <laughs> but I think that's us, right? You're like, mess with me. Mess with me, devil. You want to bring this on me? Oh, I got some more financial, financial problems. Let's go. I got some more stuff dusting up at work. Let's go. Because I've spent time at the gate, and I'm not up on this rah, 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 rah. The creator of the universe who took the punishment of my sin is with me, and I know who he is, and I speak with him all the time, and he's putting truth into my, into my life. And so that makes me live differently. And here's what's interesting. Whenever we get quiet at the gate, the Lord usually whispers to us what we need to know. I'll ask the, the worship team to come up as I, I transition here. And here's what's interesting to me is that when I get quiet before the Lord, and I'm just like, I'm like, God, do you have anything that you want to say to me? Because the Lord speaks through his Holy Spirit. He speaks through the word. But I think that the Lord, the Lord can speak to us directly. I've never had like that audible thing. But the Holy Spirit continues to say to me, when I get quiet and I'm at the gate, I'm like, I'm like, God, do you have anything you want to say to me? I've said a lot to you. Every time, I always hear this from the Lord. I just want to remind you I love you. And the Lord tells me that because I wrestle with that, with feeling loved or feeling worthy of love, right? Now, he may tell you something different. He may say something different to you. He probably will. You know why? Because he knows you. He may say, I know your heart is broken because your kids have walked away from me. I know. I know you're stressed out because your parents are on you about, like, I got to choose a college. You gotta, I know. He wants to speak to you. What happens is we get so dusted up, we're in the, in the snow globe and things just keep going. And we just need to, like, settle out. So here's what I would love us to do. And that's this. is just to... Band's gonna gonna play some uh, some worship for us, and I would I would ask us if you want to sing along, that's great. These are our prayers to the Lord, but you may just say, "Okay, Lord, do you have anything that you want to say to me?" Now, to some of you, that might be new. Like, well, that's kind of weird. But I, like, it's the Holy Spirit, man. It's it's fine. It is more than fine. But I wonder if you might get quiet and just say, "Okay, Lord, do you have anything that you want to speak to me?" And just listen to what the Lord may may have to say to you. 
you may be in such a place where you're like, I could really use some extra prayer or some people praying for me. And so I would just ask, I know we got some, uh, some pastors and uh, preachers in uh, the room today. If you guys would just uh, kind of come up over, and he, over here, and if you need some prayer, they just walk up and say, hey, could you pray for me? There may be some of you that you would say, man, I'm not in the gate. Like, I'm not in the gate. I'm not even sure that I'm with the shepherd at all. Because these promises that the Lord gives us is when he is our shepherd. And the Lord doesn't force anybody to be in the flock. That's not like him at all. He is not going to strong, not going not to put you in a headlock and say, I'm going to be your shepherd now. It's our choice. But if you've never asked Christ to be the leader of your life, the forgiver of your life, and you've never said yes to him, you become what the Bible really means when it says Christian, okay? If you've never asked Christ to be the leader of your life, the way that we say that at our place is you step across the line from believing in Jesus to following Jesus. Very different. Because you can grow up in church, your whole life and believe in Jesus and not follow him. But if you're ready today to become a follower of Jesus and say yes to him, I'd ask you just to talk to some of our, our pastors and uh, uh, ministers over here as well. So let's stand, uh, if you would. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna word a prayer and then, um, yeah, yeah. And let's, let's ask the Lord to speak. Father, we, um, you're good. You're so good to us. And Lord, we have, uh, we've lived lives that have been eroded by the things that we've heard. We've heard snow so many times that it's probably done more damage to us than, than we could know. But we thank you that you're a God of yes. That when we turned away from you, while we were still sinners, you died for us. While we said no to you, you were still saying yes to us. Who is there like that? And so, Lord, as we just kind of pause right now, I would ask your Holy Spirit to speak to us. As we just say, what do we need to hear? As we're at the gate, what do we need to hear from you? God, we love you more than, than our lives could ever <coughs> express. We're so grateful that we're not only forgiven of our sins, but that we can have this kind of relationship with you. And so, Father, I pray that you would that you would whisper strongly into our ears. I pray that anything the enemy wants to speak right now would just be silenced, Lord, as you do battle in the heavenlies and that you would speak life and wholeness and healing. Some of us have a word we need to hear from you right now, and so we welcome that as we pray in the beautiful name of our amazing gate and our beautiful shepherd, Jesus. Amen.